Good morning. All right. I'd like to welcome everybody to Temple Methodist Church on this cold and windy day, but thankful that we are all here. Uh, announcements are in the bulletin. They're also on the TVs back behind me. The only other special one that I want to bring up is real quick. Women, women, next Sunday, the men are feeding you guys. Cube steak, mashed potatoes, Valentine's Day coming up. So that'll be next Sunday, and I know it's Super Bowl Sunday, but that's what we got. So. Uh, any other announcements, like I said, are in the bulletin. Um, otherwise, we are going to get it going, and uh, let's see. So, Kathy, looks like our call to worship is Amazing Grace. Just like the first verse only. It is going to be on the screen, so it'll also be in the brown hymnal, number 391. So, if you would please stand, let's do Amazing Grace, verse number one. <laughs> It's going to be Higher Ground. That's going to be number 171 in the brown. It'll also be on the screens behind us. All verses of that one, 171. <laughs> Thank you. 
kids, come on down. Kids, come on. Everybody got that, right? <laughs> Jesus loves me. So my uncle has been on a bag for his intestines for like a couple of years now, uh -huh. but he finally got good test results and hopefully this week will be his last test to where they can put him back together and he can get rid of the bag. All right, good deal. So Sam's uncle's health is steadily improving, hopefully for much better soon. Good deal. Anybody else? Any other praises? All right, well, I guess we'll move on into prayer. Any prayers you need to think of? Unspoken. Unspoken. Unspoken, okay. Anybody else? About prayer for trouble for uh, Mark and his family. It's nasty out there, and they got a, a hol good holiday. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any other unspokens? Yeah. Calvin, if these people don't have anybody to pray for, they can always pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were always thinking of you, my man. When, when I don't see it, just put a hitch in my giddy up. <laughs> so, we're glad you're here. All right. Well, one thing that we did not do is, uh, I know Mark normally says he didn't get to shake everybody's hand, so how about let's take... Just a minute, Miss Gabby, and uh, say make sure make sure that you say hello to everybody and say it's good to see you, brother. <laughs> We took, we took things out of order today. That was that was my fault, so I'll, I'll take the blame for it. But uh, we were finishing up the praises and prayers. Um, obviously, everybody's always got got something going on. A lot of unspokens. So, uh, yes, ma'am, Patsy. Uh, I'm going to lift my son, my youngest son, Mike, uh, up to the Lord. Uh, he's 
He lives right outside of Nashville. Okay. And the company he's working for is closing. So he's really, really bad about procrastinating. So he needs to be looking for a new job. Or we're going to be seeing him and his kitty cat sitting on the side of the road. <laughs> well worked for cat food. <laughs> All right. Not past this long. You get them moving. I'm sure you Father, we bring these prayers and praises to you today, knowing that you hear us at all times, even though a lot of times we don't have the faith to continue on. Life is hard. Things happen. But we try to remember the end goal in which you taught us. We try to keep the faith. It's hard. We keep these prayers lifted up to you health, wellness, and overall well-being. We keep these praises coming as sometimes we can't recognize them as praises at the time. But let us take this as an opportunity to look into you and what we have instead of what we don't have. In those times that we don't have the right words, you've given us the correct words. You taught us to pray by saying, our Father, Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. have our ushers come forward for morning offering.
our friends, our relatives, our neighbors, our spouses, all of our loved ones that we love them. But this, when I think of this song, I think, how often do we tell God that we love him and thank him for saving our souls? He didn't have to do it, but he did it out of his love for us. reading from today is from the Gospel of Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. If you would please stand for the reading of God's Word. Jesus called his 12, his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. 
Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and, Th and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to take a second and introduce our speaker today, Mr. Robbie Haynes. No, we're missing Mark, but I think he's got something really good for us. So uh, we'll see what he's got to say. Rob? Thank you, good. This is not good. Good to see everybody again. Um, a couple of months ago, I met someone from another country that asked me, what religion are you of? You ever had somebody ask you that? I said, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in signs and wonders and the power of God and divine healing. More specifically, I'm a Methodist. And she said, oh, all right. <laughs> <clears throat> so when I was here a year ago I told you that uh, 1998 the Lord told me to start reading John Webster's journal and I did that uh, not as a Methodist and so I knew absolutely nothing about Methodism I mean I had taken church history at Lee University but it was just a summary of all the denominations and I remember uh, the first time, I won't read this to you, it was so profound I had to go sit down for about 15 minutes. Or right, This was uh, by John Wesley's journal, right? December 20th, 1742. When I came home, they told me, the physician said he did not expect Mr. Myrick would live till the morning. I went to him, but his pulse was gone. He had been speechless and senseless for some time. A few of us immediately joined in prayer. I related the naked fact. Before we had done, his sense and his speech returned. Now, he that will account for this by natural causes has my free leave. But I choose to say this is the power of God. That it is also defined as power of evangelism it's reaching the lost by signs and wonders which he just read that i believe that's scriptural that's the way the early methodists did it that's in john wesley's journal uh that's in other first and second uh generation methodist preachers and i have a book i want to show you this is another methodist evangelist he's called the it's a John Sung, he's called the Chinese John Wesley. Uh, there's so many signs and wonders in this book that I can thumb through it at random and within 30 seconds find either he's casting, he's casting out a demon, uh, he's praying for someone to be healed, uh, he's having a prophetic word from the Lord, and he was Methodist, not, not Pentecostal, he was Methodist. Uh, now, there's a part two to this guy that John Wesley prayed for. On uh, December 25th, 1742, the physician, this is, <laughs> this is hard to read because I've heard some doctors say this. The physician told me he could do no more. I, I'll tell you, when I was a part-time chaplain, I've had some doctors say, dead before morning, there's nothing more we can do. 
I don't, I don't have enough time to talk about divine healing. But I've seen the doctor be wrong more than once. And I'm not anti-doctor. If you know who my wife is. She's a physician, so I'm definitely not anti-doctor. And she believes in signs and wonders and the power of God. The physician told me he could do no more. Mr. Meyer could not live over the night. I remember there was an internal medicine doctor at Villarica. He, he was referring to a certain woman. He said she's going to be dead before the night. And my wife said, this is it. I said, well, what about the other people we've seen healed, divinely healed? And my wife said, but in this case, it's even worse than the folks you saw healed that were brain dead. She's dead. I said, well, she's still alive in the life support. Right? No, she's dead. She's going to be dead in a couple hours. I said, but the Lord told me just a week before that she was going to live. And I know her from, from the Lord. And she said, well, I hope so. I hope so because she's going to be dead in a couple of hours. So anyway, she made it. She made it through the night. And then I started doubting myself. I was coming back from about, I think two days later, I was coming back from Newton. And I'm on uh, alternate 27. And you know what, like when you get out of Newton and that little store on the right, I heard the Lord speak to me. He said, just when it looks like it's not going to happen, it's going to happen. So I pulled over at that store. I got out my cell phone and I called my wife. And I told her, I said, she's going to live. And my wife said, I hope so because I can't even believe she made it through the night. I said, well, the Lord told me she's going to live. Just what it looks like it's not going to happen, it's going to happen. So anyway, make the long story short, yes, she did live. Now, here's what I like that the doctor had to say about it. The, the doctor is board certified in two specialties, critical care and internal medicine. He, the doctor told this woman's husband, he said, this was a Muslim doctor at that, right? He said, I don't think you understand just how big of a miracle this was. He said, imagine you have someone drown and they're dead for 30 minutes and then you call 911 and the paramedics show up and they slowly pull her out of the water and they slowly drive her to the AR and they slowly get to her. Imagine a person in that state being dead, living. He said, that's what it's like that your wife is still alive. Now, even it even gets better than that. So, yes, she lived, but the doctor said she's going to have to be on dialysis the rest of her life. And I told my wife, I said, well, if she's already been healed from this and that, I said, why don't we go pray for her regarding her kidneys? And so we went Sunday. Oh, I want to say uh, first and foremost, I do not have to get the healing. I don't even know if anybody really has that gift. But the good news is, the Bible says that we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So that's what I stand on. I also stand on that the Bible says that we have a better covenant established on better promises. And I'm standing on that. And so I feel like that's all we need when we're praying for the sick. We have a better covenant, and Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. John Wesley's favorite verse, by the way. Amen. So we went in there, and I prayed for her kidneys. And then uh, my wife prayed for her kidneys. And then so when we stepped out the door, as soon as we stepped out, the Lord spoke to me. He said, the regeneration process of her kidneys started when your wife prayed. And I just looked at my wife and said, hey, the Lord just told me the regeneration process started for her kidneys when you prayed for her. I said, she's going to be healed. And so 
Anyway, that was Sunday. Uh, uh, Monday, she had a little bit of, uh, I don't want to sound embarrassing, a little bit of urine output. Uh, Tuesday, a little bit more. Friday, the, the uh, nephrologist or the kidney doctor, as you probably call him, said, she's healed. And so, uh, so when I say I have a good reason that I believe in divine healing, it's not because of what I've studied in church history, which is good. And I like that. But I'm talking about uh, divine healings I've seen in person. And so regardless of all the liberal theology that's out there, uh, well, all these seminaries teaching and preaching, uh, this is not for today. Uh, that hasn't been my experience. And then, uh, and then for the people who say, well, what about medicine? What about medicine? What about medicine? Well, I'm all for that too because, hey, we've got the best uh, Methodist hospital in the state of Georgia called Emory. And so that traces back to Methodism. So we're, we got it covered on both angles. Now, let's see, the, the next part was, uh, so I've been studying Methodism since 98. Let me make sure I'm not going too long. And I wanted to make sure that what I believe about Methodism is correct. Um, because, you know, basically what I did was just study the journals of John and Charles Wesley uh, and other uh, camp meeting preachers. I really don't like reading bi uh, biographies that much because... Uh, the trouble with biographies is, uh, say, for example, if you have a liberal uh, theologian and they go through, say, 10,000 pages of research and they don't believe that divine healing is for today, even though it's in the autobiography of that person, guess what they're going to do? They're going to edit out the signs and wonders. And uh, so that's why I just primarily just stuck with the uh, autobiographies and the journals and the diaries because I wanted firsthand information. So I finally got to be friends with this uh, professor from Union Theological Seminary, which is one of the United Methodist approved seminaries for the most part. Uh, some of the district superintendents don't like them. They said they were uh, too radical, too charismatic. And uh, so anyway, Dr. Peter Bellini is one I got to be friends with. And uh, so we've been texting back and forth for about a year. And so I want to make sure I was really on the right track on believing what I was believing about historical Methodism. So I sent him a text. I said, what's, what's the three main things that shut down or what was the three main tears that messed up Methodism in the 1800s? And he texted me back. This may sound offensive, but hey, this is what he said. It's his words, not mine. He said, they wanted to be respectable and not thought of as backwoods or undignified. Hey, I'll take that. I'm backwoods and undignified, so I'm, I'm going to take that one. That's me. They wanted to be like the Presbyterians and Episcopalians, so they built and educated their clergy in seminaries. In seminaries, they became liberal, used professional musicians and choirs, etc. They no longer were a revival movement at that point. Number two, they stopped teaching entire sanctification. Number three, they stopped mandatory small groups. Now, number two is, now John Wesley, I want to quote John Wesley, volume four of his journal, which this is a lost doctrine in Methodism, by the way, entire sanctification. Uh, I would call it deliverance, uh, there's some other words for it, but John Wesley said, wherever, now this is after the preaching houses were raised up, he said, wherever the doctrine of sanctification is not preached anymore, revival shuts down. Now that was John Wesley's words, not mine. And uh, regarding the stopping the small groups, now what happens in the small groups is, is that's where the people keep praying for each other, have breakthroughs with the Lord, where they're able to maintain revival. Because the thing about Methodism, and I'm talking about the Methodism I study, Methodism, and Dr. Bellini confirmed this because I asked him this through text a couple of days ago. I said, am I right in saying this? Is Methodism 
100% a revival movement. And he texted me back. He said, yes, it is. And so uh, I want to see all the Methodist denominations get back to the roots of historical Methodism or what I would call authentic Methodism. Methodism is a revival movement 100%. Uh, it should be that the Methodist churches of all the Methodist denominations, they should be leading the way on revival, not the other denominations, because John Wesley said God specifically raised up Methodism to reform the nation. And John Wesley would continue to do covenant renewal services uh, every, once every year to renew the covenant of what Methodism was supposed to be for. So uh, I do not believe that the Lord has shut down the Methodist revival. Uh, we can have it if we want it. That's the way I look at it. And me personally, I've made up my mind. There's been some days I've lived in it, so a lot of days that I haven't. But I want to personally live in personal revival, whether anybody else wants it or not. That's the way I, I feel about it. And I feel like I'm a Christian first and Methodist second, but I want to live what Methodism is supposed to be. That's, I believe that's the Lord's perfect will for all of us, that we live holy, consecrated lives, that we live in personal revival as a lifestyle. That's what Methodism really is. Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to do a little summary of uh, John and Charles Wesley ministry before salvation. Let me make sure I'm not running out of time here. So, as you know, John and Charles Wesley were raised in a Christian home. And so, you know, by the time, uh, now I heard of an uh, independent Baptist minister, I listened to, he was talking about Methodism on YouTube. I thought it was going to be something that was pro-Methodism. He, uh, he was actually, the whole thing was slamming Methodism. But it was actually a pretty good talk because I thought all of his insults were actually compliments uh, he said, I blame John Wesley for the holiness and Pentecostal movement. And I said, yeah, that's good. That's good. But uh, he said, I don't think John Wesley was that intelligent. Now, I want to tell you something interesting that John Wesley did when he was uh, 21 years old. Samuel Wesley, his father said, look, John, I got, a, I got something I want you to do. I want you to read the Old Testament the Septuagint Greek. I want you to read the Old Testament in Greek, right? The Septuagint Greek. He said, it's going to take you about a year. And then I want you to read the Old Testament in Hebrew. And I want you to compare the two and tell me what you think. I mean, how many 21-year-olds can read the Bible in Greek and Hebrew? Well, and I'm thinking, and he says that John Wesley is not that intelligent? I mean, let's, uh, let's get back to uh, John Wesley's sister, uh, May table when she was uh, nine years old. She read the New Testament through in Greek. And so the Wesley family, uh, their household was like a little miniature Bible college. And so they were raised memorizing scripture, singing hymns, going to church. And then by the time, uh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So John Wesley was ordained in 1727, and he felt like uh, he wanted to do more. And he also felt like something was missing in his life. What he wanted, what he was after was authentic Christianity. And so what do you do when uh, most of the church is dry, formal, dead, and most of the Christians are hypocritical, including the pastors? So what do you do when, when the church is in that state? Uh, what he did was... He searched and searched uh, church history. And so he studied church history like, I mean, the, the amount of pages and amount of hours he put in studying uh, church history, I think it's about equivalent to a, a double doctorate degree in historical uh, Christianity. And so uh, by the time John and Charles uh, accepted the call to go to Georgia, John's and Charles' spiritual state was they had extreme inner turmoil. 
Now, they had extreme inner turmoil because they thought, because they had been water baptized and tried to keep the Ten Commandments according to the flesh and tried to be good according to the flesh. That They were real Christians. But see, uh, John and Charles didn't have a sense of God's forgiveness. But one thing that John and Charles did that they thought was like, oh, now I'm rescued. Now we know really how to live as authentic Christians. They found a book by William Law, and I call, they were under the law twice, uh, under the Ten Commandments, under, and under this, uh, this guy William Law's book, where they were spellbound by his book. His book was called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. So they use that as sort of like their rule book and textbook on how to live as authentic Christians. Uh, the only thing it did for John and Charles while they were in Georgia was set them up for failure. So uh, Charles goes back first because uh, General Oglethorpe gets tired of him and basically uh, makes up an excuse like, you need to go back to England. I need, uh, I need all these letters taken back to England. So he goes back to England. So when Charles gets back to England, he tries his new ministry, and basically nobody wants to listen to him. See, the, the thing about preaching is, uh, it's like what the, uh, the old uh, preacher from the 1800s called Edward McKinney Bound said, you can't give out what you don't have. Uh, if you don't pray, and if you're dead inside, even if you're a good speaker, all you're going to do is give out dry, dead sermons. That's all, uh, that's all Charles Wesley did when he was in uh, Frederica, Georgia. Nobody wanted to listen to him. The best he could do was uh, about three people because what he was giving out was nothing but death. But So when he gets back in uh, 1738, he goes through a gradual process. He meets uh, a Moravian missionary named Peter Bowler. And so uh, the thing about the Moravians is we need to thank God for the Moravians because God put the Moravians in the path of John and Charles Wesley to show them what true Christianity was and what it's supposed to be. Now, uh, I got a few things I want to I want to read from uh, Charles Wesley. This, this is from my book on page seventy three. How uh, give you an example how Charles was spellbound and under the law. This is on the way back to England. Charles uh, wrote in his journal. While in Boston on Sunday, October 17th, 1736, Charles borrowed a copy of Law's book. Now this is what Charles said about William Law's book. While I was talking at Mr. Checkley's on spiritual religion, his wife observed that I seemed to have much the same way of thinking with Mr. Law. Glad I was surprised to hear that good man mentioned and confessed all I knew of religion was through him. I found she well, I found she was well acquainted with his serious call. And has one of the two that are in New England. I borrowed it and passed the evening in reading it to the family, Mr. Williams, where I've been some days, his daughter, and he seemed satisfied and affected. All right, now just uh, about a year later, I want, to, I want to read how he changed his views on uh, William Law. This is after Charles got saved, right? So here's the scary thing. Think, think about this. Let, let it sink in. You can be raised in a Christian home. You can read the Bible in Greek and Hebrew. You can be an ordained minister. You can have pure motives. And Charles Wesley's definitely had pure motives. But you can have all that ordained, already doing the ministry, being a preacher, and still not be born again. All right, so uh, 1739, Charles wrote, read part of Mr. Law on regeneration to our society. How promising the beginning, how lame the conclusion. Christianity, he rightly tells us, is a recovery of the divine image. And a Christian is a fallen spirit, restored and reinstated in paradise. 
a living mirror of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. After this, he supposes it possible for him to be insensible of such a change, to be happy and holy, translated into Eden, renewed in the likeness of God, one with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and yet not know it. Nay, we are not to expect or bid others expect any such consciousness if we listen to one who too plainly demonstrates by this wretched inconsistency that his knowledge of the new birth is mostly in theory. Now, if that sounds bad, and I don't, I don't have the letter with me, you should hear what John Wesley wrote to William Law. They actually knew him personally. John Wesley wrote a one-page scathing letter to William Law, it, which basically can be summed up by saying this, hey, you set me up for failure. You set my brother up for failure. We did everything you said, and I've come to this conclusion. I don't think you know Christ yourself. And anyway, I've read that letter about three times. It's uh, pretty funny. That's how I came up to, uh, well, how I came up with the, the phrase, they were under the law twice, uh, trying to be saved by being good and then uh, also picking up William Law's book and trying to live out the Christian life according to somebody uh, else's expectation. But the balance of all that is, didn't Jesus say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light? And so if you find some kind of uh, Christian book that's going uh, to gonna come up with about 50 things you need to do so you can be accepted by the Lord, throw that thing in the garbage. The only thing that we need to do is uh, what John and Charles Wesley did. And that here was their plan of salvation. Their plan of salvation was renounce all your good works. Because John Wesley said, my good works even need an atonement. So they would tell people, you, you want to know Christ? You need to renounce all of your good works. Don't lay hold of anything that has to do with your good works. And put your trust in the merits of Christ. And like, also like the Moravian said, often rest in the wounds of Jesus. All right, so now here's the exciting thing that what I really liked about John and Charles Wesley. After they get saved, their journals sound completely different. It's, it starts sounding like this is not even the same person that wrote in the journal. This sounds like a completely different person that's now right. It takes on a, a whole different tone. You know, uh, I want to uh, go to a few more pages once it, uh, Charles Wesley is soundly saved. Like I said, you, uh, as a preacher, you can't give out what you don't have. If you have death, you're going to minister death. If you have a doubt that Jesus is who he says he is, you're going to give out that doubt unintentionally. All right, so uh, 149 in my book. This is Charles writing in his journal about his uh, field preaching. Remember, like I said, in Frederica, the best he could do is about three or four people. All right. Uh, Tuesday, May 29, 1739. Franklin, a farmer, invited me to preach in his field. I did so to about 500 on repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Wednesday, May 30th, 1739. Convinced a sick man of unbelief. Another on his deathbed received forgiveness and witnessed a good confession. I invited near 1,000 sinners with whom the whole place was filled at night to come weary and heavy laden to Christ for rest. Sunday, June 17, 1739. My brother preached to above 10,000 people, as was supposed in Moorfields, and to still a larger congregation in Kennington Common. Sunday, June 24, 1739. Found near 10,000 helpless sinners waiting for the word in Moorfields. I invited them in my master's words as well as name. Come unto me, all you that travail and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sunday, September 2nd, 1739, there was supposed to be above 4,000 at Bowling Green. My subject was, to you and to your children is a promise made. 
Many experienced the great power of truth. Preached at Rose Green and near 5,000 souls upon God so loved the world. Uh, Monday, September 3rd, 1739, preached at the Brickyard to upwards of 5,000 from 1 Corinthians 6 9. I marveled at their taking it so patiently. When I showed them, they were all adulterers, thieves, idolaters. Then it's found in John 1 in Gloucester Lane with demonstration of the Spirit. Now, when you read that, it, just think back to when uh, when Charles was in Frederica and nobody wanted to hear him. It's like, so now Charles is a full-fledged revival preacher preaching with the demonstration of his spirit and power. Now, uh, the thing about uh, evangelism is if it's, if it's done the Lord's way, we don't have to talk anybody into getting saved. I want to read this uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1. And I, brethren, this is Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthians. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words, of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith shall not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So when John and Charles Wesley and the first and second generation preachers preached, and they basically turned England upside down and America upside down, they did not go around trying to talk people into getting saved. Actually, if you can talk someone into getting saved, I guarantee the devil can talk them out of getting saved before the day's over. They didn't have to try. They they were not good speakers. I've read uh, other accounts of uh, John Wesley when he preached from other eyewitnesses. They said that when he preached, he was like he stood like he was a stone statue, and basically showed no emotion. But see, he had the overwhelming presence and power of God where he didn't have to say much. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. And this is one of my favorite uh, uh, things that took place in his journal that shows you don't have to be a good speaker. It's just simple words. But if you have the power of God, it makes all the difference. So John went uh, to a well-to-do family to uh, have lunch. He was invited there to eat lunch. As he was going out the door, he looked at the maid and said, be in earnest. And then just walked on out the door. And then he came back a year, late, a year later and that maid pulled him to the side and says, hey, you know when uh, you were here last year and you told me to be in earnest? She said, I don't even know what the word earnest means, but I know that when you told me that, that my heart burned for three months. Now see, that's what I'm talking about, the, a demonstration of the power of God. It's not about how good of a speaker you are. I'll give you another example of Charles Wesley. So John and Charles had preachers in training. And there was one uh, preacher in training that uh, he had given up. He said, I'm, I'm just not a good speaker. I'm done with this. And then uh, he went and heard Charles preach and noticed, like, Charles is not a good speaker at all. He stumbled, uh, he messed up the words, and he just can't, really, he's not a good speaker at all, but he has the power of God. I'm going to get back into the ministry. So it's funny that the guy was actually encouraged because Charles wasn't a good preacher, but he recognized he had the demonstration of the Spirit and the power. And I'm telling you, that's what it's going to take to get people saved. We've got to be walking and living in a demonstration of, the, of God's Spirit and power. Uh, I'll give you another example of what I'm talking about, uh, a demonstration of God's Spirit and power, and then I think it'll be about time to close. So John was preaching at a certain area in England. I don't know what he was preaching on, but... After uh, he left the town, he came back that same town a year later. And this man came up to him and said, 
hey, I'm the uh, shop owner of like, some kind of business in town. He said, he said, I stood out my door and listened to your sermon while you were preaching. He said, uh, I used to be a bad alcoholic. All I did was hear your sermon and it did something and it made it to where I'm no longer an alcoholic. So, so John's sermon, he wasn't even really preaching against alcohol. So the guy hears one sermon and he's completely delivered from alcohol. I mean, that's a miracle right there. That one sermon can deliver a person from alcoholism. And that's the thing about Methodism that we need to get that back. Because if, if we don't have that power, then what other choice do we have? Spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on marketing gimmicks, on bigger buildings, and some kind of marketing stuff to get people in. And then when they're in, are they really changed? Have they been delivered? As all uh, the early Methodists was, would say, have they been sanctified and delivered by the power of God? So, uh, anyway, all right, I'm going to close in prayer. And Okay. <clears throat> Father, I just pray right now for signs and wonders in strong measure to rest over Temple Methodist Church. I just pray, Lord, right now, and you know who those are. And Lord, you said through the Apostle Paul, there is no, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I just pray, Lord, right now, if there's someone feeling condemned, that Lord, they would say that's not from you. I just pray, Lord, right now, if there's someone under spiritual blindness, I pray that be removed in Jesus' name. I just pray, Lord, for those that may doubt who you are. I just pray for a greater, a greater revelation that, that Jesus that you are still mighty to save indeed. I just pray, Lord, for those struggling with uh, secret sin. I just pray, Lord, they will see Jesus. You are still mighty to save indeed. I just pray, Lord, for those struggling with some kind of physical ailments. I pray, Lord, they will see Jesus. You are still mighty to save indeed. That you still heal. That you are seated at the right hand of the Father. That you're not willing that any should perish. Amen. very much for that around it. Um, our closing up today is Victory in Jesus. We're going to do verses 1 and 3. It's going to be number 415 in the brown hymnal. I believe words should be off the screen. So please stand for our closing hymn number 415. <clears throat>
Christ's light out into the world. Amen.